Hello hackers, welcome to another Hacker Hermanos video. Today we're going to do a conceptual overview of the series Intro to C2 Infra for Red Teams, C2 Redirectors. Let's talk about what is redirection, what problem it solves, how it solves it. We'll describe the basic components, a few of the common methods for redirection. During the demo videos in this playlist, we show several ways to set up redirectors using open source software. In our Intro to C2 playlist, we learn about the basics of C2 servers and how we can use frameworks like Mythic to establish positive control of a target. Get excited because we'll see how these traffic managers we call C2 redirectors do their thing. So we managed to get initial access to our targets network through a compromised endpoint or server with internet access. Nice. For now, let's imagine we did not listen to our red team lead and we went ahead and configured our payloads to connect directly to a C2 server. Big no-no. Even Michael Scott thinks so. Well, so let's say that the incident responder Gary got an alert that reads something like multi-stage incident involving command and control on endpoints. Incident responder Gary, knowing that this is anything but good, decides to take a look into the alert and finds an IP address that he can recognize as any legitimate business service. After reviewing the firewall policy to validate it is not in the sight or range of any familiar service, the conclusion is that among other steps, all outbound access to this IP must be blocked as part of the playbook to contain the asset that this alert was issued for. Because we did not listen to our red team lead, whose advice to us was to set up C2 redirection, now our C2 server is blocked and our engagement might have to come to an end. But wait, can we send another payload and fish the same or another user with a similar pretext? Not really. Because let's imagine for a moment that we could consistently get implants past initial execution hurdles, which is a topic for another day altogether. This C2 implants just won't connect if the C2 server IP is blocked. The voice of our red team lead sounds in the back of your head. Do not start the engagement with a C2 redirection in place. Consequently, to protect our C2 server from being blocked by defenders, we will hide our C2 team server behind another server. This intermediary server is what we call a redirector, and it will be responsible for relaying C2 traffic to our C2 server. The connectivity scheme goes as follows. First, our C2 implant requests a connection to our C2 redirector hostname on domain4.com. Second, the redirector's domain hosted zone's DNS record will resolve to the IP address of our C2 redirector server. Third, the C2 redirector server is listening for incoming connections on the interface assigned to the public IP address that the DNS record resolves to and forwards the connection request to our backend C2 server. Fourth, with one of the methods we'll cover in the next section, the C2 redirectors will forward inbound C2 traffic sourcing from the C2 implant to our C2 server on number four. Additionally, the same process occurs on the opposite direction and the results of the commands are sent from the C2 implant into target to the C2 server where we can see them. Ideally, forwarding of non-C2 traffic to other non-suspicious sites is performed. This can be done with the reverse proxy C2 redirection method. But wait, what are the C2 redirectors made up of then? Let's describe the basic components of a C2 redirector deployment now. Domain name system, we would want to have a domain name that sounds convincingly benign to make it harder for incident responder Gary and the threat hunter colleagues to think that there is anything funky going on with the domain. Once we have selected our all-star domain name, we need to create some DNS records in the host zone that point to the publicly available IP address of our C2 redirectors listening interface. Another optional but still recommended component is TLS. TLS is another factor that helps making our C2 infrastructure look a bit less suspicious. We would want to have a certificate issued by a certificate authority to our convincingly benign domain name to make it harder for incident responders and threat hunters to identify our C2 redirector domains as suspicious or even worth investigating. Once we have our certificates issued and we'll need to make sure that they're configured in a web server application serving as a reverse proxy. By the way, the web server application will be used as a reverse proxy. We'll cover the details of this soon. When the blue team is investigating the domain, they will see it as having a valid certificate. The padlock symbol is green, totally safe, right? A twofold benefit here, it has an implicit sense of trustworthiness and it avoids browsers from issuing warnings about lack of encryption or potential for adversary in the middle. At a minimum, our C2 redirector deployment will need the following. Listening capability, the redirector must be capable of accepting incoming connections. This usually involves a port bound to a specific IP address that is accepting inbound connections at least from the target's network. If we wanted to improve the realism aspect of our C2 deployment, our C2 redirector will accept inbound connections from anywhere on the internet and handle non-C2 traffic through its forwarding capability. The listener processing the redirector must be able to handle multiple concurrent connections. This often requires features like connection forking, if you're thinking about TCP redirector using SOCAT, which we'll discuss in with the next set of slides. It is not much of a concern when using more robust web applications like reverse proxies and Apache. What we're seeing on the right-hand side of the slide is listener configuration for HTTP and TCP listeners on Cobalt Strike. Forwarding method is something that we'll break down on the next section in a deeper level, but for now I want you to know that once a connection is received, the redirector needs to forward this connection to the actual C2 server. 
This is typically achieved through mechanisms like reverse proxying. Forwarding of C2 traffic needs to be configured in such a way that only our C2 implant traffic arrives at the C2 server, whereas any other non-C2 traffic is redirected to a non-suspicious looking site. Protocol support means that the redirector should be relaying traffic without breaking the protocol's underlying functioning. There's additional considerations if we're forwarding HTTP, HTTPS, DNS, or transport layer protocols. These are very different in their functioning. The C2 server must have a listener configured to transmit messages in the desired protocol. What we're seeing on the right-hand side of the slide are some of the considerations that are different on the HTTPS and DNS redirector types, as well as a configuration for a listener on Cobalt Strike using the port 80 for HTTP and the IP address of the listening host. For logging, it is not strictly necessary for redirection. Logging can be critical for operational security, however, because by logging incoming connections as attackers can identify any potential investigative activities or attempts to trace back to the C2. Logs can help us in a deconfliction situation by allowing us to go back and see timestamped activity describing what happened and when. If you're especially concerned with covering your tracks, it might be beneficial or obfuscate logs to avoid leaving traces also. For access control and filtering, it helps us prevent unauthorized access or detection, and the redirector might implement some form of access control or filtering. This can range from simple restrictions based on source IP address or destination to more sophisticated mechanisms like requiring certain HTTP headers or cryptographic key exchange or a mixture of all of them. On the right hand side of the slide, what we're seeing is a network security group allowing certain port 80 to a certain resources in virtual network, as well as allowing access of the port 3389. We need to also have the ability to quickly change the destination of our C2 server or even relay traffic to multiple C2 servers based on the characteristics of the C2 traffic. What we're seeing on the right-hand side of the slide is a diagram and an Apache redirect is working as a reverse proxy. So invalid requests uh, redirect via 302 HTTP code method to a 404 page. Also valid requests are a proxy to the payload server via HTTP. We covered what is redirection in the context of a C2. Then we moved on to what are the components of a C2 redirector. Now let's break down the common methods to achieve C2 redirection. So we have TCP forwarder. We can use TCP and UDP with a program called Socket, which is just a multi-purpose relay tool that helps us establish bidirectional byte streams between two addresses. This Unix tool has been used since the dawn of times to connect multiple types of inputs and outputs. Think of it as a netcat with a lot of life experience, and it has learned that adaptability is survival in a world where the only constant is change. I bet you never thought that we could hack words into poetry. However, DNS uses UDP, which is a stageless protocol. For this reason, if we want to set up a DNS redirector, we must instruct socket process to fork itself. Think of this as cloning in the process table. Every time a new UDP diagram is received, UDP proxying requires setting socket to drop connections as soon as the forwarding is complete, because socket does not have control messages that indicate when the connection needs to be uh, closed. So it is implemented through a timeout. The process table will soon be filled with socket processes if we don't implement this timeout because UDP does not have these messages like I was mentioning. Keep in mind that before the timeout closes the connection, socket will use up compute resources through the fork you mentioned earlier. This can be optimized according to round trip timeout messages, but that's a deeper topic than the scope of this talk. I can go deeper for an advanced redirection optimization session. If there's interest, please leave your comments below. We would be exploring the intersection between performance optimization and red team infrastructure, which is pretty cool in my opinion. Let's break down the simple TCP reverse proxy. So first we have sudo. For these type of operations, we always need root privileges. We have socket, which is the command itself, stands for socket cat. And then we have a block on number three for a TCP4 listen, which is incoming IPv4 TCP connections. It instructs sockets to listen on a specified port. In this case, we can use 80 if we were to relay HTTP traffic on port 80. Comma fork is a very important option. Without it, socket would terminate after the first connection is completed. And we certainly do not want that. With fork, it creates a new process for each incoming connection, ensuring that it can handle multiple simultaneous connections. On number six, we have TCP4, and it specifies that the forward connection will use the IPv4 protocol. Number seven is the IP address of the destination server. And number eight is the destination port in the destination server. This is normally where the listener will be configured to. Any incoming connections to the machine running to this command on the C2 listener port will be transparently forwarded to a specific C2 IPv4 address and C2 listener port. Transparent in this case means that the client side of the connection or target or victim will not be aware of this. IP tables is a tool that enables us to configure the IP packet filter rules of the Linux kernel firewall. We use them for NAT based forwarding and it can be used also to establish, modify or delete rules in an IP filter chain, which is just a sequence of rules used to determine how the packets are processed based on their IP address and other attributes. IP tables in this case is used as network address translation mechanism to modify the source and destination IP address and the packet headers. The combination of these two mechanisms is the very reason why this is a powerful method to forward command and control traffic. The concept behind NAT redirector is to apply two NAT operation to incoming packets. The packet first must be redirected to the C2 server, but at the same time, the packets must also be translated so that it appears to come from the redirector. On one hand, we can modify inbound C2 traffic from compromised systems into our C2 redirector. And on the other hand, we can then forward 
this modified traffic back to our C2 server without ever giving away the true location of the C2 server. So here we have the three general blocks to configure a NAT C2 redirector. In the first block, we have 80 and 443 destination NAT operation. In the second one, we're allowing connections to port 80 and 443. While in the third one, we're enabling IP forwarding at the kernel level, while also applying the masquerade operation that will modify the source IP address of the packets that are being sent on the outgoing interface to the C2 server. In summary, these commands uh, configure the Linux system to act as a packet forwarding router. While it not only forwards packets between its interfaces, it also makes outgoing traffic appear as if it's originating from the C2 redirector's IP address. This is what allows the C2 server to respond to the C2 redirector without getting in connection with the target. Apache Nginx can be configured as reverse proxies to forward command and control connections to a C2 redirector. They can selectively route traffic based on specific attributes like user agents and URI paths, like we we're mentioning, ensuring that only desired C2 communications pass through. This setup aids in obfuscating the true C2 server and filtering out non-target or unintended traffic. If there is interest, I can prepare a session going on a deep dive on the different ways of configuring reverse proxies with Apache, Nginx, etc. If we cover the specific configuration necessary to set up an Apache reverse proxy, we have on the first block the C2 redirector domain information. On the second block, we have where to fetch the files for the website that are going to be served. In the third block, we have certificate information if we're going to forward HTTPS traffic. In the fourth block, we have some of the modules and options that we're setting the reverse proxy with. Number five, we have our error and access logging. And number six, we have the conditions that are used in the Apache logic to forward and rewrite the traffic HTTP headers. Domain fronting is leveraging popular cloud platforms like CloudFront, Fastly, or Cloudflare to obfuscate the true destination of C2 traffic by making it appear as if it's destined to a benign domain. Adversaries can bypass network filtering. These platforms then redirect the traffic to the actual C2 server, making detection and blocking considerably more challenging, requiring full SSL interception. In the past, I've successfully leveraged content delivery networks like the ones mentioned in this slide to bypass my target's egress traffic filtering. If your employer uses Cloudflare for their applications, it is likely that you can configure your C2 traffic to be redirected using domain fronting, and they will allow this traffic to go through because it won't be able to the difference between your C2 traffic and their developer's traffic into their legitimate applications. TCP and UDP forwarding can be achieved in many ways. NAT and TCP forwarding via SOCAT are two of the options. They're not the same, so I've made some relative comparison here that I'd be glad to discuss with you in the comments. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. Otherwise, let's check the rest of the videos for this playlist where we'll go the different ways setting up C2 redirection.